as Olivia said, um, I spent the last summer and fall working on my thesis project. And um, I was looking at the way that phenotype is related to the success or not of invasive plant species. And so in doing this, I collaborated with another undergraduate student who was in Turkey. And this is what we found. So why do we study invasives, first of all? Well, I'm sure that most all of you, if not 100% of you, are familiar with this, I like to call the cheat grass sock predicament. Um, I have lost many a sock to this, and just due to irreparable damage, can't get them back. But anyway, um, we study invasives from more than just because they're a nuisance, but um, they're expensive to manage. Uh, they have detrimental effects on ecosystem function and biodiversity, and they're not overly well understood. Uh, as Ilva mentioned earlier, there's over 30 hypotheses currently in circulation pertaining to invasion ecology. So how do we study invasives? Well, one approach would be to compare natives and invasives to kind of see how they use the resources and how they change the environment they inhabit. That doesn't really give us that much insight as to the mechanisms of how a plant becomes invasive to begin with. So then we kind of keep going and we have another approach, um, the biogeographical approach. So let's say we look at one species that is native to, for example, Europe and compare it with the same species, but when it is found in its introduced range, like North America. Um, in this way, it kind of allows us to see more um, possible evolutionary and ecological differences and the way these affect the way species invade. So although I'm not going to go into the over 30 hypotheses with you today, although that sounds super fun, um, I'll talk about these two, which were the basis for um, the questions that I asked in my research. The first of which is enemy release. So enemy release suggests that in its native range, plants are plagued by all kinds of predators, um, pathogens, herbivores, all of these things. And um, these herbivores, etc., they limit the extent to which these species can um, expand. So they're limiting. Whereas in the introduced range, these enemies don't exist. So the limits put on these species in their native range aren't there in the introduced range. And so the reason that they're allowed, that they're able to expand without check is because they're lacking these enemies. So they are effectively released. Building on this first hypothesis, we have the evolution of increased competitive ability, or ICA. So ICA suggests that because plants in their native range have these host of pathogens, herbivores, predators, they are forced to allocate more of their resources to defense. So they grow smaller than plants in the introduced range, which don't have these enemies. Continuing with that thought, um, plants in the introduced range can allocate more resources to seed production, whereas in the native range they can't. So essentially, in the introduced range, they should be bigger, produce more seeds, native range, smaller, less seeds, because the resource allocation goes to different things. Um, these two hypotheses have been developed in a number of previous studies, a couple of which I will explore with you today. Um, the first study is one done by DeWalt et al. in 2004 that looked at a shrub, a soap bush, um, and it was found that there were fewer signs of herbivory in the introduced range. So this supports the idea of enemy release. A second study, actually a meta-analysis done by Bostorf et al. in 2005, looked at ICA and found mild support for ICA in that half of all invasive plants have higher growth, grow bigger, in their invaded ranges. A third study, Calloway et al. in 2004, um, was a greenhouse study, biogeographic in nature, that um, looked at whether or not soil origin affects knapweed growth. So does knapweed grow better in soil found 
accumulated brought from its um, native re range in Europe, or does it grow better in the introduced soil from Native America? While these studies are extremely informative, they have their limitations. For example, studying only one species. So um, by narrowing the focus to one species, it kind of misses, we miss the opportunity to be able to um, see any patterns that might exist between, you know, among invasive species, a, like a general pattern. Additionally, a lot of these studies are done in a greenhouse. So that also um, is limiting in that we miss any cumulative effects that might occur um, from evolutionary or ecological changes, differences between the ranges. Keeping that in mind, with this project, um, myself and my collaborator in Turkey, this is Birsen, um, we took biogeography out into the field. So in order to account for some of those factors that you can't see in a greenhouse, um, we did a field study. Additionally, we studied six species um, to try and see if there was a pattern. So what did we ask? Well, first of all, does a relationship exist between invasive success and plant traits? The second question was, do successful invaders grow bigger and produce more seeds in their invaded versus native ranges, while unsuccessful invaders do not? So like I said before, um, we focused on six target species, and now I will go a little bit into the history of each of these species and then explain why these are the six that we chose and why um, these would be helpful in answering the questions that I just described. So the first species, we all know, cheatgrass, Bromus tectorum. Um, cheatgrass came to North America in 1889 via grain contamination. It is currently a priority three listed species in Montana, meaning that it cannot legally be intentionally spread or unintentionally spread, but it can't spread. Um, the second species, St. John's wort, Hypericum perforatum. Um, St. John's wort was actually brought intentionally to North America in the 1690s for medicinal purposes. It is currently a priority 2B species on the Montana noxious weed list, meaning that it has to be eradicated or contained, and it is considered a noxious weed in eight other states. Um, our third species is sulfur sinkafoil potentilla recta. Sulfur sinkafoil arrived sometime before the 1900s. Um, it continues to be a big problem in the West. It is also a priority 2B species in Montana. So same goes, um, must be eradicated or contained. Our fourth species is the musk thistle, Cardioas nutens. So this plant arrived around 1852 um, it does very well invading rangeland and pastures, which proves to be problematic because it outcompetes good foraging species. So it is a listed species in 25 states, but Montana is not one of them. Um, fifth species is bulbous bluegrass. I'm sure many of you have seen this out on the ranch. It does very well in highly disturbed areas, as well as grasslands and woodland areas. Um, it also was brought here via grain contamination in the 1800s, and it is not a listed species in any state in the U.S. And lastly, we have sheep sorrel, Rumex acetacella, which um, the arrival date is not really known, but it is listed in three states and not in Montana. So why? Well, I created this little diagram, which I'll fill out here in a little bit, um, three of the species, the first three species that I just um, gave a brief overview of, are considered to be invasive, and three of them are not. So by comparing these species, we can potentially look for um, traits that are similar amongst invasives and traits that are similar amongst non-invasives. So we have cheatgrass. And above the line, um, and this diagram will come back in a smaller form, so I'll just go over it really quick. Above the line, invasive, below non-invasive, the middle is kind of a neutral zone. Um, so cheatgrass is invasive, uh, St. John's wort is invasive, and sulfur sinkfoil is invasive. 
and then we have the musk thistle, um, bulbous bluegrass, and the sheep sorrel. So, keeping that in mind, my hypotheses were, if ICA is at work, I predict that the three invasive species will exhibit greater overall biomass and seed production in Montana. Conversely, the opposite will be true for the non-invasive species in that they will be bigger in Turkey and produce more seeds in Turkey. Well, what did we find? Well, so, um, like I said, we did a field study. And um, the populations, these are the two maps, and I'll zoom in on Montana really quick. Um, as you can see, the, each point has a letter and a number. So the letter is letter corresponds with the species. B, Bromus tectorum, H, Hypericum, PR, Potentilla recta, C, Carduus nutans, P, Poa bulbosa, R, Rumex acetacella, and then the number is simply the number of population that that was in. Um, so we aim to collect 10 populations. So some, uh, some of the species up here go all the way up to 10. We weren't successful in collecting 10 for all of the six species because some were much more difficult to find. So, um, these were really not sites that were determined. And so um, what I spent most of my summer doing was actually trying to find all of these places and using a variety of different sources. But um, yeah, as you can see, we have the bitterroot and then up where there's a big bracket and all of those um, were from the bison range. I spent a lot of time on the bison range this summer. And um, yeah, some are further spread out and I had help collecting, Alexi was super helpful in helping me collect populations that were farther away. And so that's Montana, and here we have the map from Turkey. Um, in Turkey, the populations were largely collected from three areas. Um, all were over a thousand meters, and so in doing this in the field, we recognized that um, if the environments were different, it could somehow confound the data. So we did our best to make sure that um, we were sampling from the same type of grassland area, same elevation, et cetera. So what did we look at? Well, um, once all of the samples had been collected, one of the things we did was look at the shoot biomass. So this was done by drying all of the, we took the seeds out, dried, the shoots for 48 hours at 65 degrees Celsius, and then weighed them. Another thing we did was count the seeds. Um, this was done slightly differently depending on the species. So for cheatgrass and bulbous bluegrass, we counted the individual seeds, the seeds per individual. Then for the musk thistle, St. John's wort, and Potentilla recta, we counted um, the capsules or capitula that we found on each individual, and then a subset of those, so three per each individual, we counted the, how many seeds were actually in that capsule. And then we extrapolated to, found the, to find the total number of seeds per, per plant. Um, unfortunately for the sheep sorrel, we were unable to count the seeds per individual because it is a clonal species and so discerning what is an individual um, was not consistent. So we don't have seed number per individual for that species. Um, we do have seed weight, however, which was done by counting 10 subsets of 20 seeds and then taking the average for each population. And then last thing that we looked at were pathogens and biocontrols. So um, this was done for two species, the first of which was the musk thistle. Um, the biocontrol for this is the Rhinocillus conicus. And as you can see here, it's, um, this is one of my favorite pictures, I just think it's super cool. but. Um, it's eating its way out of the plant. And so what we did there is when we would break apart these capitula to count the seed numbers, uh, we would actually count the number of individual weevils that came out of each seed head, as well as the number of seeds that were chewed or attacked or somehow predated. Um, for the other species, as Ilva mentioned, we did um, the Ustalago, and this was done by figuring out the percentage at a site that was infected. So what did we find? Um, so quickly here, I'll just go over 
the graph, all of them look very similar. Um, on the left, we have Turkey. On the right, Montana. The y-axis tells you the variable that we're looking at. For the shoot biomass, for the smaller species, they're in milligrams. The larger species is in grams. And then on the top right corner, um, we see where it falls on the little chart. So we're looking at cheatgrass. It's invasive. The shoot biomass. And then the last thing is um, the letters on top of each error bar designate whether or not the findings are significant. So if the letters are different, then um, it's significant. If they're not, it's, it may trend towards one way, but they're not necessarily statistically significant. So what we see for this, um, shoot biomass, cheatgrass is bigger on Montana. Cheatgrass produces more seeds in Montana, seeds per plant. And funnily enough, the seeds weigh less here. So for St. John's wort, um, the opposite is true. Bigger in Turkey, significantly bigger in Turkey. Shoot biomass, um, also one of our invasive species. Um, produces significantly more seeds in Turkey. Another, in, still a contradiction. And then it trends towards having slightly bigger seeds. Potentilla recta follows the same trends, although these are not significant. So bigger in Turkey, more seeds in Turkey, and um, the seeds are, they, the seeds weigh more in Turkey. So then we move to the plants that are suppressed or non-invasive. Um, here we have the musk thistle which as you can see is just so much bigger in Montana. And this is something that we knew even before really analyzing the data just from having conversations and looking at pictures. It's just obviously so much bigger. Um, and that shows. It also produces more seeds here. The seeds are bigger in Turkey though. So just an intermission from the graphs. Um, I just wanted to show the a comparison. So on the left, um, in Montana, I think this was on the bison range. And generally, when I would see them, they were somewhere between this range on my body. There were, of course, some that were shorter, taller, but generally, that was the average height. And so as you can see on the right, the plant in Turkey is comparable to Ilva's hand. Um, so just crazy different sizes. For Poa bulbosa, another one of our non-invasive species, um, bigger in Montana, it trends that way, but it's not significant. It does produce significantly more seeds here, but again, it's not invasive, and the seed weight was about the same. For the sheep sorrel, um, these were fairly similar, so the shoot biomass is pretty close, and so is the average seed weight. So what does this mean? Well, there's really very limited support for ICA in these results. The only species that really supports ICA is the cheatgrass. And it, it grows significantly bigger in Montana. It produces significantly more seeds, um, following with my hypothesis that if the species is invasive, it's gonna be bigger and produce more seeds, which it does. Should potentially be taken with a grain of salt because there is a theory possibility that um, cheatgrass occupies an empty niche in that it's the only annual in our perennial grassland, grassland. So maybe it's not really because of ICA, but anyway, that's the support that I have. Um, on the other hand, we have three species that contradict ICA. The first of which is the St. John's wort. So St. John's wort was bigger in Turkey and produced more seeds in Turkey significantly. Similarly, the Potentilla recta, it trended the same way. And so why is that? Well, um, Ilva mentioned earlier a, co a collaboration between herself, Dean Pearson, Ozken, and Jose with Turkey and Argentina. And from some uh, preliminary data there, we know that the biodiversity is higher in Turkey. So they have more species than we do. Well, 
um, invasive species are shown to take advantage of empty niches and lower biodiversity. So when they come to Montana, it's possible that there's just less species to compete with. Maybe that's why they're successful. Another possibility is enemy release. Um, Grayson and myself actually collected roots from all of the samples that we got in the field. They're either in Turkey or our freezer. And so that gives us the possibility in the future to look at whether or not there's, there, are more pathogens, there are more pathogens on the Turkish roots than ours, and maybe that's a reason why. Um, so then the third contradiction is the musk thistle. So this was one of the non-invasive species, but it grew it was huge here and had way more seeds. So why is that? Well, maybe it's undergoing a lag time, so it's gonna be invasive in the future. But I personally think it's unlikely because it's been here since 1892. And it's already invasive in some other states. So maybe in Montana, it's just undergoing a exorbitantly large range expansion. Um, the other two species continue along the lines of having no apparent pattern. Um, so pole bulbosa, again, produced more seeds here, but it's not invasive, just meaning that um, seed production is not necessarily indicative of a plant. Massive seed production is not indicative that it'll be invasive. Uh, Rumex, again, potentially just going undergoing a range expansion. Um, so now that I've discussed the shoots and seeds, let's look at the biocontrols and pathogens. So here we have Bromus tectorum, cheatgrass, that has the Ustilago. So um, what we found, and as Ilva mentioned, there was only one population in Turkey that had this. I saw it everywhere, ranging from 30 to 75%. Um, but yeah, it was every single place that I went. And this is a native to Turkey along with cheatgrass. So it's possible that it's just taking advantage of the fact that its host plant is doing really well here. Um, so killing the host plant really wouldn't serve its purpose because it wouldn't be able to survive. So it's just taking advantage. Now we have my favorite picture, um, the rhin rhinocillus. So These little guys are what comes out when you break apart a capitula. And they don't look that bad until they are all over your living room at one in the morning. And it's not great. But um, I'm sure some of you have maybe seen some of the refugees around the lab, and that's my fault. I'm sorry. Um, here I made a graph of the number of attacked seeds per capitula. So it's much higher in Turkey, even though this insect, weevil, was introduced here to control um, the thistle. It's really not doing what it was intended to do. It's not really doing bad things necessarily, I mean, to other species, but it's, it's not controlling the plant. Um, so then we have a table that shows um, the average weevils, average attacked seeds, and average viable seeds per capitula in Montana and Turkey. And then the percent in each that was predated upon. Again, there's half the amount of weevils found here than in Turkey. The attack seeds are way less. The viable seeds are way more. And so the percentages are wildly different. 81% to 6%. So 81% of the seeds in Turkey were chewed and 6% here. Um, it's, it's a biocontrol, but it's not doing its thing. So what conclusions did I come to? Well, there seems to be no consistent relationship between invasive success and size or fecundity, as shown by the contradictions. Um, that being said, ICA does not appear to provide, general, to provide a general explanation for invasion. And then I would like to acknowledge my funding sources, the Irene Evers Scholarship and the Montana Space Grant Consortium, and then also thank MPG Ranch.